chapter 27, we're almost to the end, is the story of Paul's voyage and shipwreck. You know, um, if you weren't doing what you were doing, what would you have done? If I hadn't been a preacher, I would have become a football coach, American football. If Luke hadn't been a doctor and a missionary and a historian, he would have been a travel writer because he loved to write about these sea voyages. And, you know, if you read the Iliad and you read the Odyssey, you read about sea voyages, but those are myths. And this is history. It's detailed history. He crams in so much of it. The hardest Greek in the New Testament is in Acts 27 because there are so many words which have to do with sailing and have to do with ships and travel. And those words are only used once in the New Testament. There was a writer, very famous writer in his day because he was a great wit. Born in Ireland, went to Oxford, became famous in England, traveled to America, died in France in 1900. His name was Oscar Wilde. Some of his plays are still produced today, like The Importance of Being Earnest. Some of his novels are still read today, like A Portrait of Dorian Gray. Oscar Wilde made some very poor choices and he lived a very immoral life, but the, the Portrait of Dorian Gray is a very moral novel. It makes a very strong moral statement. I would encourage you to read it sometime. It's really an amazing book. Oscar Wilde was a brilliant Greek student, but he never studied. He was just smart. He was just good at it. He didn't have to study. He was, he was a genius. But he frustrated his professor because the professor knew that he never studied. So, one day, the professor decided to embarrass him. And one of his studies during that term was the Greek New Testament. That was one of his courses. So his professor of Greek New Testament was determined to embarrass and humiliate him. So he gave him a, a, what we call in English a pop quiz, an unannounced exam. He came to the professor that day and he didn't know that he was going to be tested. So of course he wasn't prepared. So the professor picked up the Greek New Testament and he turned to a passage in Scripture and he handed it to Oscar Wilde and he said, translate please into English. And the passage that he gave to him was Acts 27, the hardest Greek in the New Testament, knowing that there was no way Oscar Wilde could possibly translate Greek that hard. So Oscar Wilde took the Greek New Testament and he began to read and he translated it perfectly, absolutely perfect. And instead of the student, the professor was embarrassed and disappointed. So after several verses, he gave up and he said, that's enough, Wilde, that's enough, that's enough. And Oscar Wilde said, oh, please, sir, can I go on? And the professor said, why? And he said, I want to see what happens. He had never read it before. He had no idea what happened. But you see, you know what this teaches us? It teaches us that it's an exciting story. It's a story that makes us want to know what happened. It's a story that makes us want to know the end. That's a true story. It's in the book, The Oxford Guide to Oxford, an, expert, uh, an excerpt from Oscar Wilde's life. We've come to Acts 27 the story of the final sea voyage and shipwreck on the way to Rome, the next to the last chapter of the Acts of the Apostles. 
this is a story which really happened. This is a factual account of a sea voyage and a shipwreck from the eastern part of the Mediterranean to Italy in the first century. There have been books written about how the words of this chapter corroborate and supplement uh, everything we know about um, sea travel in the first century in the Greco-Roman world. So I don't, want, I don't want to take anything away from the literal course of events. Luke is just simply telling us what happened. It's obvious that he was keeping a journal. You know, it's a very hard thing to keep a journal. You might think that you're going to keep a journal when you go somewhere, but most of the time you don't. It's obvious that Luke did because he's such a master of detail. He was recording what was happening while it was happening, while it was happening. He was on the boat with Paul. In not wanting to be too allegorical, I will say that Acts 27 is also a picture of who the Christian is, where the Christian is, what's happening to a Christian, and what the Christian is supposed to do. The whole world is like a ship, and the ship is, the people in the world are expecting good weather. They expect they're going to get what they're going without difficulty, but they're not. They're sailing into a storm. And you know what? We as Christians, we sail with them. And we tell them what to do. We tell them what it means. We tell them what, what's necessary if they're going to save their lives. And that's exactly what happens in this passage. Paul uh, goes from Caesarea down to the seashore and they take a ship from a place in Turkey just below Troas where he'd been before. And he's given into the care of a man called Julius who is a Roman centurion who treats him really well. By the way, centurions come out really well in the New Testament. It was the centurion in Matthew 8 whose faith Jesus commended. He said, you know what? There isn't any Jew who has as much faith as this Gentile centurion. It was the centurion who first declared below the cross at the crucifixion that Jesus must be the Son of God. And this centurion named Julius comes off well in, in Acts 27 because when they get to Sidon, you know, they're making many stops along the way. They're hugging the shore. That was necessary. That's the way you sail then. You didn't sail the straightest route straight across the water because that was too dangerous. You had to keep yourself near the shore because it was so dangerous to ride on a boat and because the storms would send those little boats to the bottom so quickly. So they had to stay near the shore. So they go to Sidon modern-day Lebanon, ancient Phoenicia, and Paul has friends there. He's got friends everywhere. And Julius allows Paul to meet with his friends, even though he's a prisoner. And so they determined, they determined to go to Cyprus. And um, then they get on an Alexandrian ship, a ship from Egypt, which is going to, to Italy, and they ran into some rough weather. They sailed um, toward Crete, and they thought that um, after a time, they, they realized how, how dangerous the voyage was. And Paul begins to tell them in verse 10. Now, he warns them. And I think we need to look at this warning. He says, this voyage is going to be hard. There's going to be damage and there's going to be loss. Not only the cargo of the ship, but the ship. Not only the ship, but of our lives. Now, two things. Did he make a false prophecy? Because they did lose the ship and the cargo, but they didn't lose their lives. I will argue that it's not a false prophecy for two reasons. Um, one reason is this. 
Whenever God makes a prophecy, He always holds out the prospect of mercy if there's repentance. Now, the most famous example of this is the prophecy that Jonah made to Nineveh. In 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. There was no part of that prophecy that, had any, that held out any hope. But if you repent and do the right thing, I'll forgive you and let you live. That's not a part of the prophecy. But when they, you may not recognize this word in English, when they repented, God relented. In other words, when they did repent, God showed mercy and He let them live. Now, they went back to their old ways and a hundred years later, Nineveh was destroyed. But Nineveh was not destroyed after 40 days because they repented. So, I think one thing uh, that, that is implicit in any prophecy of doom is if you go on your way without repentance, you're going to die. But I think there's something else, too. I think what Paul is saying is, you know what? This is going to be terrible, and we're going to lose everything. You're even going to lose your lives, but I think the suggestion is, unless you listen to me, unless you do what I say. And before the end of the, maybe not at that moment, but before they'd gotten very far along, Paul tells them, okay, if you'll listen to me, you don't have to die. You're going to lose everything on the ship, and you're going to lose the ship, but you don't have, have to die. So, Paul says, look, we need to be careful about this. We, we don't need to go any further. But it says in verse 11, that the centurion listened to the pilot, not the prophet. He listened to the man who knew how to sail ships and guide ships. He didn't listen to the man who was the Bible teacher. And so they think they could, they thought they could make it. So they took off in a westerly direction. They were trying to reach a southern harbor in Greece, in Crete, just below Greece, to spend the winter there. And when they started out, there was a nice wind from the south blowing, so they thought, this is going to be all right. But after they started out, there was a terrible storm, and the wind actually had a name. Do you know that in Germany, in Bavaria, there's a wind that blows up from Africa, and it has a name. They call it the Fern. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing it. The Fern. That's the wind that blows into Bavaria from Africa. They blame it on all kinds of funny behavior. There's a song about a wind in Oklahoma that they call Mariah. I don't know if it's just in the song or if it's really true or not. But there was a name for this wind. It was called Euro, Euroquilo or Eurokia. Verse 14. And when the ship got caught in that wind, um, they were driven along. I guess the anchor was dragging, and they were being pounded and dragged by the waves. They couldn't make the ship go where they wanted to go. It says in verse 16, they could not get the ship under control. They came to a small island. Um, in verse 18, the storm was so bad they had to throw the cargo off. In verse 19, the storm was so bad they had to sh throw some of the tackle off, some of the things that were necessary to guide the ship the way it needed to be guided. And then for many days they never saw the sun. All they saw was this terrible storm until finally they came to the conclusion, we're never going to get out of this. We're going to die out here. We're going to drown. Now, between verse 21 and verse 38, Paul intervenes three times. The first thing he tells them is that you should have listened to me. You have this phrase in English. Do you ever talk about someone who says, I told you so? Um, in America, we think this is a little bit naughty. You know, these are this not really good manners when you warn somebody, they don't listen to you. 
everything gets messed up just like you said it would get, get messed up and then you show up and you say, I told you so. I told you this was going to happen. That's kind of way of, we call this rubbing it in, you know. They mess up and you rub it in, you know. You're not content just to be right, but you, you have to remind them of how right you were and how wrong they were. That's really not the best manners, but you know what? Paul has to remind them of that because he's going to have some more advice for them and they better follow it because it's a matter of life or death. They did not follow his advice that time. They lost the ship's cargo. They lost the ship's tackle. Now they think they're going to die. Paul had warned them that they were going to die way back in verse 10. But in verse 21, he comes to them. He says, you know what? Uh, you should have listened to me. If you'd listened to me, you wouldn't have lost the ship. But I got good news for you. Verse 22. If you will listen to me, you won't die. And then he tells them, amazingly, that an angel of God came to him and said, you know what? You're going to make it to Rome and you're going to stand before Caesar. And you're not only going to make it, but everybody with you is going to make it. And he says in verse 25, so men... Don't be afraid because I believe God and I believe it's going to happen just like he told, just like he said it was going to happen. But you know what? The ship is going to run aground. We are going to lose the ship. Okay. Then in verse 27, it says that it took another two weeks. They were being battered about and about midnight, they thought that they were getting to land. And the sailors at this point were going to escape and forget about their duties and forget about their passengers and just get away. And Paul knew what they were doing. And Paul told the captain, you know what, uh, unless those sailors were made on this ship, the, everything's going to be lost. So the soldiers cut the ropes of the lifeboat so that the sailor, sailors could not get away. Now they're, all, now they're all on the ship by themselves. And they hadn't eaten in a long time. And on the 14th day, Paul said, you need to go ahead and eat something now. We don't need to save the food anymore. So in verse 36, it said that they ate. There were 276 people. And in order to lighten the, the ship, they threw the rest of the food overboard. Amazing. But then they came up to a beach and um, they strike a reef and the ship breaks up. They lose the ship and the soldiers plan to kill the prisoners so that they can't escape. But the centurion who wants to save Paul commands that the prisoners not be killed. And uh, in that way, holding on to planks, and swimming and holding on to different things from the ship which they which now fall into the sea they all make it to land 276 people are saved it's a miracle that's the end of Acts 27 the great shipwreck scene in the book of Acts the island that they were on was Malta if you go to Malta today, you're going to find lots of um, memorials to the fact that Paul once visited there. And it was winter. They're going to spend the winter there. And it's amazing that Paul is, is helping set things up. It's cold. He's helping gather sticks to make a fire. And while he's gathering sticks, a snake bites him. And everybody sees it. And everybody thinks, this must really be a bad man. I don't know if you have this expression in Russian, but in English, one way we describe if somebody just has bad luck, they're kind of under a curse, they're under a cloud, we say he's really snake bitten. He's really snake bitten. That's what we say in English. And the people who see him get bitten by that snake, here's what they say. They say, he must really be bad. The gods must really hate him because he survived the shipwreck and he didn't drown. 
But as soon as he got to land, a snake bit him, and now he's going to die. Paul shakes the snake off into the fire, offending animal rights activists everywhere. He sh shakes the snake off into the fire. They expect him to swell up and die, but he doesn't. Now they think he's a god. Just the opposite of what happened in Lystra. Acts 14, Paul and Barnabas come to Lystra. They heal a lame man. They think he's a god. They begin to worship him. The Jews come down and convince everybody that he's a bad man. And so now they want to stone him. In Malta, the exact opposite thing happens. First they think he's a bad man, and now they think he's a god. They think he's a bad man because the snake bit him. Now they think he's a god because the snake bite didn't hurt him. These people are obviously very superstitious. The leader on the island with the Roman name of Publius had a sick father. Paul healed him. And after Paul heals the sick father, everybody on the island who's sick comes to Paul and he heals them too. Now can you imagine what the soldiers think? Here they have this prisoner. What's he doing? He's healing every sick person on the island. This is the prisoner they're supposed to take to Rome to be tried for his life. Can you imagine the impact that he made? They stayed three months spending the winter there on Malta. Then they find another ship from Egypt, and they sail from there to Sicily. Syracuse, the capital of Sicily. And from Sicily, they go to Regium. Regium is the, you know how Italy looks like a boot. Regium is the tip of the toe. They make it to the tip of the toe of Italy. They come to another place called Petili. They stay there seven days, and finally, Verse 14, dramatically, thus we came to Rome. Thus we came to Rome. The Christians somehow found out he was coming. They met him outside the city. They entered, when they entered Rome, Paul was allowed to stay, we might say, we say in English, under house arrest. He wasn't in jail, he wasn't in prison, but he couldn't leave. And there was a soldier guarding him. And in Rome, he meets with the leading Jews. He defends his gospel. He defends his life. He defends his mission. He tells them that he is loyal to the God of Israel. He's loyal to the law of Israel. He says in verse 20, I'm wearing this chain for the sake of the hope of Israel. I'm not fighting against Israel, I'm fighting for Israel. In verse 22, they say, well, you know what? We, we, we want to listen to you. We, we're here. We're, we're listening to what you say. We want to listen to what you say, but we got to tell you something. Everywhere, the things you believe are attacked and spoken against. And you see, this is the point of view that will prevail among the Jews. This is the point of view that will, that will, rise, that will gain ascendancy so that today 99% of Jews are not Christians. There are many wonderful Jewish Christians, but the vast majority of the Jews have believed the enemies of Paul they have believed the doctrine of the high priests, the doctrine of the Sadducees, the doctrine of the Pharisees. They have rejected the idea that Jesus is the Messiah of Israel. It's spoken against everywhere. Um, in the place where he lived, large numbers of people came to see him. They would visit him every day. And it says in verse 23, 
He was explaining to them, testifying about the kingdom of God, trying to persuade them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and from the prophets from morning until evening. Now look at verse 24. Some were being persuaded by the things which were spoken, but others would not believe. That's exactly what we saw in Acts 17 after the sermon on Mars Hill. Now, earlier today, I talked about how an unsaved person has a fallen nature. An unsaved person cannot accept the things of God because those things are spiritually evaluated and they have no spiritual apparatus, no spiritual equipment to recognize the truth and, and to respond to the truth. And I tell you that the truth alone was not enough, that God had to do something. There had to be a spiritual operation to take place, to free the person, to give the person sight, to change the nature. That doesn't mean that we don't press the truth on them. We do our part, God does His part. We can't save anybody by ourselves. Charles Spurgeon said, I could just as easily, in, I could just as easily create a planet as I could save a soul. But we do plead with men and women. We do plead with unbelievers. We do show them the truth, and that's what Paul does. It says, some were being persuaded. In 2 Corinthians 5.11, Paul says, we persuade men. We persuade men and women of the truth of the gospel. And God is sometimes pleased to send His Spirit to quicken someone that we're pleading with, and they see it, and they run to the cross and they receive Christ, and they cling to the Lord Jesus as Savior and Lord. Some people were responding to the gospel when Paul was under house arrest in Rome. Some were saying yes to Jesus. Some were saying no to Jesus. When they could not agree, Paul spoke one parting word. Now, this is an amazing thing. We strive to serve the contemporary Christian community and with a variety of Christian educational and evangelistic resources. To see TVS resource base, please visit tvseminary.com. The book of Acts ends with one of the hardest things in the Old Testament. And do you know that this passage is quoted in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, and 1 Corinthians? This truth is taught in all those first books of the New Testament. And the truth is this, that the same gospel which softens some people hardens other people. Remember what I tell you about the nature of people, how the nature has to be changed. We have something wonderful in America that we call a Hershey bar. You probably don't know what that is. It's a bar of chocolate. I should just call it a bar of chocolate, not a Hershey bar. But on a hot day in July, if you put soft clay on the windowsill so that the sun can hit it, and if you put a Hershey bar on a dish on the windowsill so that the sun can hit it, the clay will get hard and the chocolate will get soft and melt. Same sunshine. The thing that hits the chocolate is the very same thing that hits the clay. But the same thing which makes the clay hard makes the chocolate soft. The same gospel which brings sinners to repentance also hardens certain sinners. Verse 27, This heart of this people has become dull, and with their ears they scarcely hear. They have closed their eyes, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and return, and I should heal them. So sometimes the gospel actually closed the hearts of people, because when people reject the gospel, there's nothing else to be offered. If a person will not trust in God's plan of salvation when he's offered Christ, what else can God offer him? How many sons does God have? 
What kind of sacrifice can save a person if the cross has been rejected? And this is actually the complaint that Paul registers near the end of the book of Acts and that Luke records. Look at verse 28, Acts 28, 28. Let it be known to you, therefore, that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will also listen. Verse 29 says, well, you know, that caused a fight among the Jews because they couldn't accept the idea that the Gentiles would be blessed with the gospel and with salvation. This is the way the book of Acts ends. Paul stayed two full years. Well, goodness, he just stayed two years in Caesarea Philippi. Now he comes to, now he comes to Rome and he stays two years there under house arrest. He stayed two full years in his own rented quarters and was welcoming all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God, teaching concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all openness unhindered. Some scholars believe that it was during this imprisonment that Paul was finally executed. Other scholars believe that he was released from this imprisonment and he had a time of unhindered ministry and he was rearrested by Nero. We do know that he lost his life under Nero. Some people think he died as late as 67 AD. Other people, John Stott, for instance, believe that he, believes that he died as early as 64 AD. We don't know all the details. There are traditions, there are strong traditions. One tradition is that Nero had a lover, a favorite lover. And that while he was away on a holiday, she came in contact with Paul. And Paul led her to faith in Jesus. Because she'd come to faith in Jesus, she wasn't going to be the emperor's mistress anymore. She ran away and joined a Christian community. When Nero came back from his holiday, he called from his, for his lover and found out what had happened. He was enraged, and he ordered that Paul's head be cut off. Even though it's not recorded in Scripture, we do know from letters that Christians wrote and, and records that Christians kept that Paul did lose his head in Rome under Nero sometime between 64 and 67 AD. But the time would come when men would name their sons Paul and their dogs Nero. That's the end. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.